In this screencast, we will review the typical findings of small bowel ischemia. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to identify and describe the manifestations of small bowel ischemia, and you should be able to provide a differential for the etiology of the ischemia based on the CT appearance. Small bowel ischemia results from insufficient perfusion of the bowel. The CT appearance of the small bowel depends on the severity and will change as the small bowel ischemia progresses from early ischemia to late ischemia. The most common etiologies for small bowel ischemia include arterial occlusion or stenosis, obstruction of the outflow veins, a closed loop obstruction or volvulus type of configuration that restricts the arterial and venous flow, global hypoperfusion, which may occur when a person has a hypotensive state that results in chronic hypoperfusion of the bowel and ischemia, or vasculitis or small vessel disease. When we think about early small bowel ischemia and the changes that we can see on CT, we often initially will see small bowel wall thickening. The small bowel wall thickening will often have a mural stratification appearance where there is submucosal edema or hypoattenuation of the submucosa with mild hyperemia of the mucosa. The mesentery may be normal in early ischemia but can also show some mild stranding within the distribution of the ischemia. <clears throat> the mural stratification and mesenteric stranding will often be much more pronounced if the etiology for the ischemia is thrombus within the outflow vessels such as can be seen with superior mesenteric vein or portal vein thrombosis. As ischemia progresses from early ischemia to late ischemia you can see that the bowel wall will often thin, it will become non-enhancing, and you can develop pneumatosis. You may often see increased mesenteric stranding and free fluid. This case on the left hand side of your screen is a person who initially showed some small bowel wall thickening that progressed to small bowel wall thinning with pneumatosis. Again as you see the ischemia worsen in your patients you will see small bowel wall thinning, a non-enhancing small bowel, as the wall thins and the ischemia progresses, the small bowel will often dilate due to inability to peristalse, and you will begin to develop severe mesenteric stranding or mesenteric edema. You can also start to see inner loop mesenteric fluid, which is just fluid accumulating under the leaflets or the layers of the mesentery adjacent to the atypical segments of bowel or ischemic segments of bowel. In severe ischemia, the bowel will often be quite dilated, the bowel wall will be thin and non-enhancing, and pneumatosis will begin to develop. The pneumatosis can then progress to mesenteric venous gas, where the gas is now migrated from the wall of the bowel into the mesenteric veins. The gas then travels through the mesenteric veins to the liver to create portal venous gas. Portal venous gas can be distinguished from pneumobilia due to its peripheral location. When trying to think about portal venous gas versus pneumobilia conceptually, think that the blood flow within the portal veins is going to flow out toward the periphery of the liver and therefore push the gas toward the periphery of the liver. In the setting of pneumobilia, the bile is flowing towards the common bile duct or towards the center of the liver and therefore the bile will push the pneumobilia more to the center. So portal venous gas is peripheral and pneumobilia is more central. Eventually, as the ischemia continues to progress, the patient can often also develop bowel perforation. Let's take a little bit closer look at pneumatosis. So pneumatosis is defined as gas within the bowel wall. You can see in this image on the left hand side of your screen pneumatosis on a plain film. We see that circumferential gas within the bowel wall and then gas tracking along the bowel wall. Pneumatosis can be benign 
and is often seen with chemotherapy or steroid administration. It's seen in patients who have had lung transplants or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And while pneumatosis is often benign, there are certain signs that you can see with pneumatosis that should make you think that the pneumatosis is not benign and is more likely related to ischemia. So if you see severe wall thickening associated with pneumatosis, non-enhancement of the wall, or a hyperemic wall, any of those signs should make you assume that the pneumatosis is not benign. Also, if there is dilated bowel, that is an atypical finding to be seen with benign pneumatosis. Clearly, if there's arterial or venous occlusion, then you should assume that the pneumatosis is related to ischemia. Ascites, while nonspecific, can indicate or be associated with mesenteric ischemia, and therefore pneumatosis in the setting of ascites should be more suspicious. Benign pneumatosis rarely, if ever, progresses to mesenteric gas or portal venous gas. So if you see mesenteric or portal venous gas, assume that the pneumatosis is not benign. Additionally, based on laboratory values, if there is a lactic acidosis or elevated lactate, that is a relatively specific sign in the setting of pneumatosis for small bowel ischemia. When you're trying to detect portal venous gas or mesenteric venous gas, realize that your lung windows will help you see the gas more clearly. Again, portal venous gas is more peripheral in the liver than the gas associated with pneumobilia. And it's rarely, if ever, seen with benign pneumatosis. Here are multiple examples where you can see gas tracking within the mesenteric veins here and here. You can see it outlining the veins in these images and you can see the increased conspicuity of the mesenteric venous gas when you place it on lung windows. When you think about the different etiologies for mesenteric ischemia, the first thing that often comes to mind is arterial occlusion. So if a vessel becomes acutely thrombosed, such as may happen when there's left ventricular thrombus that is ejected from the heart or other embolic phenomenon of thrombi, there's no time for your body to compensate for the loss of blood flow to the bowel through the collateral circulation and therefore the bowel will often become acutely ischemic. Uh, this is in contradistinction to stenosis. Stenosis tends to occur very slowly, and as that stenosis occurs slowly over time, your body often can compensate through the collateral circulation. So if you have slowly accumulating plaque at the superior mesenteric artery, your celiac axis or your inferior mesenteric artery can often compensate for that reduced flow. Often when there is arterial occlusion, the inflammation and changes in the bowel wall will be longer in segment than that seen with inflammatory bowel disease. You can imagine that in this example where the superior mesenteric artery is occluded, that you are going to knock out the blood supply to a very large continuous segment of bowel. And in Crohn's disease, you tend to see multiple short segments of affected bowel with intervening normal or dilated bowel. When we talk about venous outflow obstruction, most commonly we're talking about thrombus within the portal venous system and specifically thrombus within the superior mesenteric vein. When the superior mesenteric vein is thrombosed in an acute setting, the pressure within the venous system will rise and that will reduce the arterial perfusion of the bowel wall. You will see development of mesenteric edema or mesenteric inflammation and you will begin to see bowel wall thickening. As the ischemia from venous outflow obstruction progresses you can start to see thinning of the small bowel wall as the bowel begins to dilate you will also see worsening mesenteric edema. A lot of the bowel wall thickening and mesenteric edema seen in venous outflow obstruction is due to third spacing of fluids 
from increased hydrostatic pressure within the venous system. This can also result in the development of ascites or interloop mesenteric fluid. Closed loop obstruction is also an etiology for mesenteric ischemia. With closed loop obstruction, you have a twisting of the bowel around a fixed point. That twisting of the bowel results in both venous outflow obstruction and possibly arterial occlusion if the twist is substantial enough. The twist will also result in a proximal and distal obstruction of the bowel. This proximal and distal obstruction prevents decompression of the bowel and the bowel will often continue to dilate and get bigger and bigger. That increases the pressure within the bowel and also reduces the ability for the systemic blood pressure to perfuse the bowel wall. You can see a closed loop obstruction in multiple segments of bowel, but it's often seen in the ileum or the jejunum. When you do see a closed loop obstruction, one indication that it is a closed loop obstruction is there will be dilation not only of the loop that is obstructed, but there will also be dilation of the jejunum, and often that will backflow to dilate the duodenum in the stomach. So if you see someone with a small bowel obstruction who has a markedly dilated duodenum and stomach, that is a bad sign, and make sure that you look very carefully for a closed loop obstruction. Nasogastric tube decompression can decompress the proximal bowel, but it will not decompress the C loop. And that's why a closed loop obstruction ends up being a surgical emergency that cannot be managed conservatively. In this case, we see multiple transition points coming together almost like little beaks or little arrows pointing at one another. We also see this dilated C loop of bowel with substantial mesenteric edema within the distribution of that dilated C loop bowel. When you think about global hypoperfusion, we often refer to the findings we see in bowel as hypoperfusion shock complex or shock bowel. So patients who ha have septic shock or cardiogenic shock or hypovolemic shock, whatever cause of global hypotension, they have a transient poor perfusion of the bowel. That transient poor perfusion of the bowel results in physiologic changes within the bowel, which often result in vasodilation of the small capillaries in the bowel. So if the person then regains their blood pressure or regains perfusion to the bowel, you will actually see hyper enhancement of the mucosa of the bowel. You can often also see associated hyperdense adrenal glands, and that is also due to vasodilation of the capillaries feeding the adrenal glands. If the global hypotension persists for too long, you will progress to a more severe ischemia, as you can see in the case in the center of our image, where nearly all of the bowel shows pneumatosis and portal venous gas. Global hypotension or hypoperfusion resulting in small bowel ischemia is typically not a surgical situation because there is no specific lesion that can be addressed surgically. It tends to be managed conservatively with aggressive resuscitation. After aggressive resuscitation and conservative management, if there are specific segments of bowel that remain ischemic, then sometimes you can go in to resect those areas and certainly if the bowel perforates due to the ischemia it will be a surgical situation that requires surgical management. In summary, small bowel ischemia will initially look like mural stratification. The mural stratification that is often associated with an inflammatory pattern of bowel pathology. You get submucosal edema and wall thickening. As the ischemia persists or progresses, you will get dilation of the bowel, thinning of the wall of the small bowel, and non-enhancement of the bowel. 
If the ischemia continues to progress and isn't addressed, you will develop pneumatosis, portal venous gas, and potentially bowel rupture. Remember that there are multiple different etiologies that can result in small bowel ischemia and keep them on your differential when you're seeing mural stratification, pneumatosis, dilated bowel, or non-enhancing bowel.